so um, I am Marina Kegiwa Onawu. I'm a dark skinned femme presenting um, Yoruba Cabo Verdiano um, person. My pronouns are um, she, her, hers, and they, them, theirs. I am sitting um, at my husband's desk on, so there's a black um, leather, I think it's leather, faux leather, whatever, chair behind me. I have um, a, a, um, braided extensions that are dark black. I'm wearing a green shirt and I am in the background of an area where there is a kind of like a, uh, I don't know what color to call this, off-white wall with a bunch of our um, children's colorful artwork behind us. I have a couple of stimming devices on my wrists. Um, one is um, green, yellow, and orange. And the other one is um, blue, turquoise, and green. My name is Marenike Giwa Onailu, and I'm happy to be here with you all. I am the Equity, Justice, and Representation Consultant for the Autistic Women and Non-Binary Network, or AWN. Um, I'm joined here with my colleague, um, Lee, who is um, has camera off right now, taking care of some other duties. Um, and I'm also happy to have our ASL interpreter, Shirley, who is here to provide captions for everyone. And I'm especially excited to introduce you all to um, Jules Edwards, who's also known as Autistic Typing. So um, for those of you who are joining us for the first time or, for, or just for review, Autistic Women and Non-Binary Network is the um, oldest uh, ad autistic run um, organization that focuses on gender justice and, you know, just kind of transformational justice in, in general. And um, so we are um, founded by and led by an all autistic team. And um, we uh, approximately a year ago started a series that we called Liberating Webinars. And we wanted it to be, again, exactly what the name says, to liberate webinars, that they don't have to be these formal 45 minutes of um, didactic presentations and then 15 minutes of questions and just, ugh, you know, we didn't want that. We wanted to turn it into a dialogue where we share things that are of relevance to our community, to our people in spotlight and, um, you know, amplify the voices that are so important and sometimes unheard in the autistic and disability community at large. And so this is, uh, I'm happy to say our second webinar, we have a few additional ones planned with Jules. And the very first one that we did, we, um, we spoke about who is autistic type A? Um, what is the, where did the name come from? And just kind of some things about, um, about all of that. So I encourage you if you're not following um, autistic typing on social media. There's a Facebook page. There's other some other resources as well. Um, but I um, want to just kind of give Jules an opportunity to um, to say hello to you all. And then we're going to be spending most of this webinar talking about um, an important tool um, called aut Autism Moon. Hi. Thank you so much, Marina Kay. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to um, talk about Autism Moon. Thank you for inviting me. Um, my name is Jules. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, or they, them. Um, I'm in a light gray room and my camera has somewhat of a purple tint. Um, I am a light-skinned indigenous femme presenting person with long brown hair. Um, behind me, there are sparkly jars of colorful beads on shelves on the wall. Um, so the knowledge that I'm going to share today is what I know to be true as an Ojibwe autistic matriarch, and it's influenced by my culture and my personal experiences. Um, and I'm so excited to share today. Um, so when I was invited to come and speak about um, autism moon, um, I really just want to describe about why something like this is necessary as a tool for the community. Um, so in 2019, I shared a written piece on my autistic typing Facebook page titled today, your child was diagnosed with autism. And it was a letter to parents. Um, and it was meant to reassure them that their autistic children are still the same lovable children that they were before their diagnosis. Um, it was meant to counter the autism awareness narrative that um, autism is a problem that needs immediate intervention in order to be fixed. Um, my goal was really to help parents understand that in order to develop a comprehensive understanding of autism, they needed to learn from a wide variety of perspectives. 
um, including autistic people. Um, professionals and educators are often regard, regarded as the experts on autism and what to do about it. And autistic people are often left out of the conversation entirely. Um, and it doesn't occur to a lot of parents that autistic adults exist or that we are advocating for ourselves and their children. Um, those professionals um, don't suggest finding information directly from autistic people. And the professionals are where parents are getting their first information about autism in general. And it's such an overwhelming and confusing time for so many parents that they don't know what to do. <laughs> Um, so without getting too far into the weeds, um, capitalism drives the narrative of autism. Um, the people with the most social and financial capital, um, primarily white non-disabled parents, um, are the ones who control what society understands about autism. Um, so part of my culture, the Ojibwe culture, is understanding that there's not one right way to live our lives. Um, and that in order to have interconnected communities, which is how our social um, environments were structured prior to colonization, um, we need to live in a good way with respect and humility um, and really consider every member of our communities. Um, so I emphasize listening to a wide variety of people because none of us know everything there is to know about autism or about being autistic. So throughout our entire lives, we'll continue to learn new things. And um, we can't learn if we don't listen to one another. Um, no, I just love that. I'm just sitting here like, wow, because I'm, I'm just sitting here thinking about, you know, how so many of the experts, you know, don't have the lived experience that we do. And people tend to view um, autistic people as perpetual children and not understanding that, you know, the, the importance of, you know, listening to different voices and, and different perspectives and honoring them. And I know in our last um, webinar, we talked about, you know, you know, several of us, you know, getting the 100 day kit when our kids were diagnosed and, and how the, the old original 100 day kit that I think a lot of people haven't seen that, um, you know, is, is pretty stigmatizing. And, um, you know, and it, it's interesting to me because in addition to like embracing who your child is and giving parents reassurance, you also build in so much humor, you know, into, you know, in, into the information that you share, you know, and it's, it's funny because, you know, the, when you think about the stereotypes of autism, we supposedly can't ever get jokes. We can't ever get sarcasm. And I venture to say it's because some of those jokes aren't funny, but, <laughs> but aside from that, um, our humor might be different. It might be more literal or more concrete or what have you, but, um, you know, I guess um, in, in thinking about autism and thinking about kind of like the perspective that, you, you know, as you mentioned, you know, thinking about a parent coming in new, um, trying to learn these things, trying to figure out how they are feeling or, or who they should listen to and all of that. You know, like, what, how does it make you feel in terms of like professionals and non-autistic people who think that we really don't have an understanding of humor? We have not spent much time together, I don't think, because I am always cracking jokes about stuff. And, you know, sometimes they're like, well, that's inappropriate or you shouldn't say that. Well, why can't I say it? It's like if it's accurate and it's not hurting anyone and it's just kind of like something that um, disrupts <laughs> the heavy mood or something like that, like I love it. Um, and sometimes I'll be like in a new social situation and um, there's maybe something like an environment that all the sticks often describe as like an awkward silence and I'm cool with it, but other people might just be like um, looking around and super uncomfortable. So I have no problem um, jumping in and being like, wow, this is an uncomfortable silence. And it's like, it's just an observation, but it breaks the ice and makes people more comfortable. Um, <laughs> I'm I laughing because I totally do that too. I'm like, oh, crickets. I'm like, nobody's talking. Yeah. <laughs> like everybody's thinking it, but nobody's saying it. Yeah. So why not just say the thing? And so, but there's also um, something I've noticed is a lot of autistic people like puns. 
um, or double meanings of words. Um, and so one thing that strikes me about autism moon in particular is um, a lot of people, um, a lot of autistic people have identified that they feel like they're on the wrong planet sometimes. And I think like, okay, well, maybe we belong on the moon. <laughs> That is so cool. Because actually, when I first read it, that's what I thought. It's like, oh, the moon. Like, first I think, okay, like monthly, like lunar, or kind of like, you know, mysterious, dark, like near the planet, but, you know, part of it, but but its own and see, you know what I mean? Kind of like shining off and doing its own thing. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's funny how you mentioned that. That's what people think, um, you know. And so, um, and so we're, we've got a few more questions, and I'm hoping actually, um, if you're willing to maybe read some of Autism Moon, or I could, or we could alternate, um, you know, toward the end for those who are unfamiliar. But um, I, I first wanted to ask you, um, so when we were planning this webinar, you know, there were um, a lot of thoughts. And um, one thing that Lee mentioned that I think doesn't get talked about enough, and we touched on it a little bit in the last webinar, is that autistic adults, you know, are often criticized as being anti-parent um, because we have a counter narrative that differs often from the non-autistic or autistic parents, um, people don't. Um, people think that we are, you know, we despise parents without the recognition that many of us are parents. In fact, for many of us, that's how we discovered our neurology in the first place. And so be, I think that, so like, because there's this idea already, the schism that exists, um, why do you think that it's important for us, for, you know, in, in your work or just as a community in, in general, um, to reach out to non-autistic parents early on um, while they're still, you know, kind of figuring things out or, you know, while there's this idea of autism and neurodivergence is still new to them, um, why is it important for us to kind of connect with them before the world taints them? <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, and it's super complex. Um, but really the reason that I do advocacy work um, and try to reach parents is because we can't help children unless we help their parents. And um, if parents don't know <laughs> information, if they have been fed this narrative that um, you know their their child is somehow broken and needs to be fixed, for lack of better terms, they're going to try and fix their child. And um, they, parents aren't given good information. And so in order to have good information, um, they need autistic people to provide the good information. And really when parents are, um, when their children are first diagnosed, they're looking for a sense of belonging. They're looking for um, someone to welcome them and say, you know what, you're not alone we can help you. Yes, you're going through something really big and some parts of it are really hard. And there's also a lot of joy and there's a community here for you and you're not alone. And so if the only people that are scooping these parents up is in, and embracing them are other parents who also have this idea that autism is bad um, and needs to be fixed, that's where they're going to go. So if we're reaching out to parents early on and trying to scoop them up and guide them towards good resources and um, helpful ways to improve their child's quality of life and their own quality of life, um, you know, that's, that's good for all of us. And it's, it's really hard um, to be an autistic parent of autistic children as well, because there's so much um, erasure um, when you go into a room with, um, you know, with other advocate advocates or an IEP meeting or something like that, um, as an autistic person, they forget that you're a parent or because you're a parent, they forget that you're autistic. And it's like, well, I bring multiple lenses to this conversation. And so I may not understand everyone's experience, but I do understand what it's like to be autistic. And I do understand what it's like to be a parent. And so I have something of value to add to this conversation. And to be, to be fair, um, because of this, you know, narrative of autism as um, a, a sum of deficits. Um, 
parents have no idea sometimes the landmine that they're stepping into in new conversations because they don't have um, the experience, the education, the background of the history of oppression of autistic people. Um, so sometimes parents get dogpiled and they have no idea what they did wrong and they just want to help their kids. So that's another tough part of it. It really is because it's like, you know, we, so, you know, a lot of people, you know, I, I tell people sometimes, you know, advocacy chooses you, you know, you usually don't choose it, it kind of falls in your lap, you know, and um, because of life's circumstances. And so, but we all have different strengths and weaknesses. And so for a lot of people, you know, they're, they're already facing their own, you know, life challenges and um, they have their own, you know, commitments and um, it can be triggering, you know, to deal with parents who are, you know, who, who've been, who are sharing, you know, things about autism that are untrue or that are harmful or stigmatizing, but they, they really just don't know. And, you know, sometimes there are those who do know, we know there's those parents, you know, who are kind of off, but, you know, I think that, you know, there, there needs to be, I know, a way for us to kind of, without anyone giving up um, their beliefs or their principles, a way to kind of find a way to connect and meet in the middle, because um, ultimately, we all want the same thing, which is for their children, who is the autistic person, to thrive. And as much as people may wish, you can't separate those children from their parents. Um, they're a package deal. They, they are part of that family. And that way the parent is engaging, processing, communicating, all of that impacts the child. And so if, you know, if they feel attacked, then, you know, that's what we're going to essentially, you know what I mean? That, that they're not going to um, feel comfortable connecting with autistic adults. And there's going to be even more of that separation, that siloing. Um, and I think also a lot of people don't think about the fact that, you um, Parents, families, they're part of our lives, you know, particularly, you know, for people of color, you may have a disagreement with the way that people view things or whether people see things or what have you, but it, you know, this kind of lone wolf idea of just, you know, the, the activist with no family connection doesn't really ring true for a lot of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah, ad advocacy is not a path that I had chosen for myself. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I do this work because um, I want the world to be a better place for my children and mm -hmm. other autistic children and future generations, because um, unfortunately, the world we live in is not a perfect world. And we live it in a world that requires incremental change as much as we would like drastic, immediate change mm -hmm. right now. That isn't the reality. So we have to fight for seemingly everything. Every little scrap, every yeah. little millimeter, you know, and, and it's hard, you know, and I think some of what can happen, and when you mentioned the thing about how it can be such a, a, a lonely feeling or a lonely place to be an autistic adult, um, and this is something that Lee and I have talked a lot about because it's like when you're, sometimes when you're around autistic, or an autistic parent rather, an autistic adult who's a parent, when you're around other autistic adults who are not parents, it doesn't mean that they don't have you know, children in their lives, nieces, nephews, people that they care for, but it's a different, you know, lifestyle. Your experiences are different when you are a parent and when you're, you know, when that is something that is a primary focus of your life. And so it's not, you know, so that is, a, and that's part of it. And then, or if people are, don't have the autistic lens and they are just non-autistic parents, they only see things through their way. And so it's kind of like, you don't really fit anywhere. Like, you know, the erasure is very real. Um, and, and I think that it, it really does more harm than good, not just to our psyche, but also ultimately um, to the collective knowledge that people have in parents. Because as you mentioned, a lot of us have, you know, had a you know, diverse range of experiences. We know what it's like to be an autistic child. Even if we weren't undiagnosed as a child, we, we knew the life, the experiences that we went through. We know what it's like to be a parent. We know what it's like to want things for your child. We know what it's like to have conflicting access needs. Um, we know what it's like, you know, all of these just different things. So it's interesting to me. So I think that like, given this, these things that you mentioned that, um, that there are areas where one can relate. There are areas of, you know, um, of, of shared experience or shared understanding. What do you think is the best way to reach parents? Early. <laughs> The best way to reach parents is early. Um, you know, there are a lot of different techniques um, that we can try and use to reach parents. Um, 
kind of welcoming them into the fold and um, providing helpful information when they're asking for help. Um, but one thing, okay, this is kind of a complex <laughs> topic and it's loaded or whatever, but and I'm going to try to explain it in a way that's um, easy to understand. But um, when we have a parent in crisis who comes to a group, including autistic people who are, um, you know, there to help parents, but the parent maybe has puzzle pieces or the color blue or um, uses um, functioning labels, et cetera. Um, a lot of the time they'll end up with, you know, dozens of comments about how this is harmful and that is harmful. And that may be true, but in that moment, that parent can't hear it. They need something to help them get out of crisis. And something that autistic people say a lot is like, ask autistic adults, we can help. Um, but <laughs> we have different learning styles. And something I've learned about is that um, autistic people have a bottom up processing style. So we learn all of the little details about a concept and we put it all together to form a complete understanding. So for us, the basis of understanding um, autism and autistic liberation and um, support is knowing all of these little pieces. Um, so th that's the information that we offer first. We offer, we don't like blue because the gender norms that are inflicted stereotypes. Um, we don't like puzzle pieces because we are people, not puzzles. Whereas parents or not parents, um, holistic people um, tend to learn from a top-down approach. So they understand a linear um, process and a, the big picture as a whole. So in order to um, kind of facilitate effective communication, we have to meet somewhere in the middle. And a parent in crisis needs that big picture information. My child is headbanging and I'm afraid they're going to get hurt. What can I do to help my kid? And um, they have all this other, <laughs> you know, problematic content in their posts. Um, but it's clearly a parent who loves their child and wants to help their child. And instead of getting helpful information about maybe your child is experiencing sensory dysregulation, here are some options. Then it's that people say, you called your daughter low functioning. There's a puzzle yeah. piece in your background. Yeah, <laughs> That's not helpful. <laughs> That's not helpful information. So when we are able to build those relationships um, and provide that bigger scale information and help the crisis resolve, then those parents are going to be like, wow, that was really helpful. I'm, I'm more open to learning from you. And even if that isn't maybe the way that things should be, that is not the world that we live in. So in order to be more effective, in order to reach them, we really have to, you know, work on finding some middle ground a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm really glad that you mentioned it this way, because it's like, um, I know people feel like, well, I'm just trying to live my life. It's not my place to have to be the ambassador for all autistic people or to have to, uh, or to have to police my words so that I don't hurt the feelings of this parent or what have you. And that's true. Every role is not for every person. There are different, if you think about a team or an orchestra or what have you, people play different instruments. People have different positions. Some people um, are, you know, better suited at being able to communicate regularly with parents than others. And some people can do it in, in, in certain doses at certain intervals of their lives and other times they cannot. And so I think that we need to, we, we um, as autistic people need to try not to be all things at once and to understand that um, maybe someone else should answer that question because the, they're going to get at where the, what the parent wants to know. You know, there's an analogy um, that one of my professors mentioned once about like, um, you have, you know, someone was rushed into the emergency room because they had a stroke. Um, they also have, you know, like a bunion and hangnail. Do you worry about that? <laughs> Not yet. You address this, the more, you know, critical and oppressing area first. 
And then of course you wanna address the other area because it is going to create problems and it is going to, to grow, um, but you kind of tailor your approach depending on the urgency of the situation. And because of the way that we think, we're actually genuinely trying to help when we say the, the puzzle pieces thing. we're not trying to criticize, but that isn't how it's perceived. And so I think, you know, even though the saying, you know, if, you know, you get more flies with honey than vinegar. And then some people will say, well, you actually get more flies with feces than any other thing. But some people are better, you know, better equipped to handle feces and deal with it than others. And, you know, and so I think that that it's okay for people to, you know, to know that some things aren't their wheelhouse. And, you know, and that's why we need tools like, you know, Autism Moon and, and you know, and other things like that and other ways that people can learn and grow um, as they need to without necessarily being a drain on, on, on those who aren't, you know, for whom that's not their, their journey, that's not their role. So this is very cool. Is there, is there anything else, I guess, thinking about like, if, you know, Autism Moon in general, or just kind of this, like, before we read some of it, is there anything else that like, you'd really like to add or share um, to anyone who might be listening to maybe a parent whose child has, you know, was recently diagnosed or um, to an autistic teen or adult or, or an educator or an ally? Is there anything that like, you just really feel like, you know, this is just, you would love for them to just kind of get this point or, or walk away and think about this some more. Mm -hmm. I do actually, um, a couple of things. So first of all, autism is not an emergency. Um, so we don't need to act fast and grab the fire extinguisher. We don't need to do that. Um, but then finally, or also, um, autism is a social communication and sensory disability. And it is diagnosed unobservable behaviors, but autism is not a behavioral disability. It's treated like it's behavioral. So that suppresses um, meeting those underlying communication and sensory needs because we're stifling the behavior. Um, but it's it's a Band-Aid approach, so. I'm so glad you said that because I agree. It's like, you know, parents will think, oh my gosh, and you're like, you're you're not in you know, your child's head banging or being teased or in distress or cannot communicate. That's the emergency. The diagnosis is not the emergency. The diagnosis is your child's reality. That's their life. You know what I mean? So, you know, so let's let, let us listen to us, those of us who are trying to advise you about the, the situation that's emergent that you don't understand. And then once we kind of get you there, then, you know, let us talk about your hangnail, which is that puzzle piece, which is that functioning language. Because yeah. um, we don't want, you know, a hangnail can also get infected and kill you too. We don't want that, you know, lingering there either. <laughs> So, but yes, I think that the message that parents get is autism is an emergency. Hit hard, hit early, early intervention, do this now and do it right away or you're not a good parent. And so a lot of people buy that and, um, and that's where they're, you know, operating from. So having something like Autism Moon is, you know, it is so refreshing because it gives someone, it gives parents another way, another way to think um, some more, you know, it gives them you know, an alternative and, you know, it gives them a sense of hope, but also reality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how do you feel about reading it? Or again, we can both read it. I can read it. I have it pulled up, but I just will. And, and we can just read excerpts of it because I really want people to actually go online and find it is what I really want them to do is to go okay. to the, um, to Autistic Typing on Facebook and you can find where, um, where Autism Moon is and, um, you know, and just kind of understand a little bit more of it. But tell me what your thoughts are. I would actually love to hear you read it because I want to hear it through the filter of someone else. Today, your child was diagnosed with autism. Maybe it came out of the blue. Maybe you already knew. Maybe you fought for a diagnosis. But today was the day it became official. It may have come with a level, or maybe the doctor didn't feel it was necessary to share that with you today. So you'll wait a month for the official report. But today, the news is sinking in and you are shaken. Autism has entered your life and it's here to stay. What does this mean for your child, for you, for your family, for your finances? What do you need to do? How do you help support your child 
Who can guide you? Why isn't there a flow chart? Or is that just me? I've been here three times. I've experienced the gamut of emotions. Here's what to do. Breathe. Enjoy your child as they are. Your child is still the exact same adorable, brilliant, lovable child that they were before diagnosis. Never lose sight of that. As a parent, you've always done everything you can to protect your child. And that doesn't end with an autism diagnosis. Protect your child's privacy and bodily autonomy. Learn how to speak about support needs in a way that will not be hurtful to your child should they overhear you. Get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Learn about autism from a variety of perspectives, including professional, parent, and especially actually autistic perspectives with a hashtag in front of Ashley Autistic. Read blogs, watch vlogs, sign up for Google Alerts, borrow every book about autism in the library. I did. Join Facebook groups. There are some fantastic groups out there that are led by autistic people. Ask questions. Make sure you ask autistic people, not just doctors and other parents. If you want to understand your child, learn about how they experience and perceive the world. Learn about how your child learns, bottom up versus top down. Before committing to any therapy or treatment, read about the history and the perspectives of the practitioner and autistic people. Soak in all of the information that you can find. Examine what seems to be accurate or inaccurate for your child. Mull over it, sit with it, place yourself in your child's shoes. Maybe even get an autism eval yourself. If you find that what you're learning, I'm sorry, if you find yourself in what you're learning, it is incredibly common for adults to learn that they are autistic after their child is identified. Dedicate the first year after diagnosis to learning without committing to anything other than improving your child's quality of life. This is your learning time. You've heard of honeymoons and baby moons. I propose an autism moon. You can't support an autistic person if you don't know anything about autism. Well, you can, but you'll flub it up and it'll stress everyone out. Autism is a neurological classification. It is not a disease or an illness. There is no expiration date on the diagnosis. Your child is not going to be more or less autistic based on whether or not they started a specific therapy at a certain age. Don't allow a profitable industry to push you into an action that you have not researched thoroughly. If the autistic community says something is harmful, listen and research. If the autistic community says something is helpful, listen and research. Your child is going to be okay. And it will be because of you, your love and your willingness to advocate for their best interests. So take another big breath. You are not alone. Your child is not alone. There is a community waiting to welcome you both. Oh, I love reading that. Sorry. <laughs> I love it. 